My name is Tuzuang and my name is Tuyen. We are group. <laughs> Today we will talk about European Union. More specific, as you know, European Union they have gone through lots of process and they also apply many theories in their integration process. In our topic today, we will define what is intergovernmentalism, classify classical intergovernmentalism, and we apply it to understand about case study of interchange crisis. And so the topic today is about the intergovernmentalism and the case study of interchange crisis. So let's move. We divided our presentation into two main parts. The first part is about what is intergovernmentalism, and the second part is about classical intergovernmentalism and its critics. So, move to the first part. You know, intergovernmentalism provides a conceptual explanation process. It is characterized by state centrism, and intergovernmentalism privileges the role of state and state actors between. European integration according to the BOSS 5.1, which is about intergovernmentalism as discussion, theory, and method. In this chapter, intergovernmentalism is defined as a theory of European integration. This means that intergovernmentalism offers a explanations of regional integration or international cooperation. Intergovernmentalism was from classical theories of international relations and realist or non-realist accounts of interstate bargaining. This is a table which is about the difference between the relations and non and there are four main sectors between them in charge of state, how to achieve survival, human nature, and energies. Marvels as an institutionalized form of interstate cooperation, European integration facilitated the survival of Western European states during the Cold War. In early 1990s, some intergovernmentalist supporters at EU integration would not survive the end of communism in CEE. According to the Post 5.2, the Europeans' rescue of the nation state. Furthermore, intergovernmentalists believe that the sovereignty rests with the EU member state. What is the sovereignty? Yeah, the sovereignty is a multi world, particularly when used the context of EU politics, uh, which is mean by holding associations with notions of power, authority, independence, or exercise of will. It may be instead in trust to cooperate and delegate a function to European level institution. The transfer of functions is from the state of its executives to lesser citizens or from parliament of member states to European institutions. And the supranational institutions are usually considered agents of the member state. Coming to my part, we will look at the classical intergovernmentalism and see its crisis. This is Stanley Hoffman, who laid the foundations of the intergovernmentalist approach to European integration. Hoffman's intergovernmentalism, which is called classical intergovernmentalism, began by rejecting neo-functionalism theory, claiming that, in concentrating on the process of European integration, neo-functionalism had forgotten the context within which it was taking place. We can understand Hoffman's point of view like this. In 1968, Hertz accepted that the new doctrine of functionalism was no longer relevant to the new reality, officially ceding its position of ideology and regionalist theory to those of intercommunism. Headed by Stanley Hoffman, he criticized the position of new functionalism, arguing that the artillery field has theoretical errors. Because of First, the integration process is not a closed process, but is also influenced by the international environment. The national state is the strongest pearl factor in the process of European integration, deciding the nature and progress of integration on the basis of concern in order to protect and promote its national interests. 
According to Hoffman, the European integration process is the process by which national governments voluntarily join agreements to work together to resolve common issue. Power remains with member states' government and decisions are made on consensus, primarily consensus among powers. In other words, the process of integration mainly depends on the will of member. This leads us to a typical case of disagreeable decision-making, the empty chair crisis in 1965. Now, let's have a quick look at this short video. Ganz unerwartet kam es nicht, aber als der Eklat um Mitternacht des 30. Juni 1965 dann passierte, löste er eine Krise aus, wie sie die junge europäische Gemeinschaft noch nicht erlebt hatte. Die revolutionäre Idee eines supranational, also jenseits der Mitgliedsregierungen finanzierten und kontrollierten Agrarbinnenmarktes war einem Mitgliedsland zu revolutionär. Frankreich und der Präsident de Gaulle zog die Notbremse. Drei Tage hatten die Außenminister der Europäischen Wirtschaftsgemeinschaft schon über den Vorschlag von Kommissionspräsident Hallstein verhandelt. Bis zum Ende der französischen Ratspräsidentschaft, um Mitternacht des 30. Juni, sollte eine Lösung gefunden sein, aber man war noch nicht so weit. Die Vertreter Italiens, Deutschlands, Belgiens, der Niederlande und Luxemburgs gingen davon aus, dass die Verhandlungen verlängert würden. Aber stattdessen erklärte Außenminister Maurice Couve de Murville, angesichts des Wortbruchs der verpassten Frist, werde Frankreich bis auf weiteres nicht mehr an Sitzungen des Rates teilnehmen. Walter Hallsteins Vision, eigene Mittel für die Kommission zur Finanzierung der gemeinsamen Agrarpolitik, die dann vom Europäischen Parlament kontrolliert würden, Entscheidungen im Rat mit qualifizierter Mehrheit, diesen Vorstoß in Richtung eines föderalistischen Europa konnte de Gaulle nicht dulden. Sechs Monate lang blieb der Stuhl Frankreichs im Rat. Now, I'd like to raise the question. How crucial was the empty chair crisis in the course of European integration? Back to the context, de Gaulle not only refused the CAP financing but also the qualified majority voting, a system in which decisions are taken when a high majority supports them and not by unanimity. De Gaulle's decision is easily explainable. This expansion of the Commission's mandate would have constrained the independence of the France to negotiate trade agreements. This voting system would have sped up the pace of European integration, but would also have lessened the national government's power. Mit dem sogenannten Luxemburger Kompromiss wurde die Eigenfinanzierung der Agrarpolitik aufgeschoben und damit auch die Haushaltskontrolle des Europaparlaments. Und den Mitgliedstaaten wurde informell ein Vetorecht eingeräumt, wenn eine Mehrheitsentscheidung entscheidende nationale Interessen berühren sollte. Die Krise war beigelegt, aber der Traum der Föderalisten hatte einen empfindlichen Rückschlag erlitten. That is the end of our presentation and there are some reference for you. Here are the tasks, so please do it and if you have any question, please feel free to ask us tomorrow lecture. So, thank you for watching, listening and see you tomorrow. Bye bye.